Our exhortation this morning uh, will be provided by Brother Roger Anderson. His title is Mystery. Um, he does not have a reading uh, for me this morning, so we'll go ahead and turn it over to Brother Roger. Well, half my audience just left. <laughs> well, I guess that's less people to complain. <laughs> anyway, it was I haven't seen that many children walk out of here in a long time. It's like everybody brought all their kids this time, and it was really nice. That was, that was a beautiful sight. You, if you sit up here and you see that, that was a beautiful sight after everything that we've uh, been struggling with lately. Uh, well, you're probably wondering what the big mystery is, I'm sure. Um, well, we've all been as I just mentioned, we've all been very distracted by the recent things that have been happening in the world. Um, with the COVID, it's filled our lives, uh, the elections, the riot, all these things many times will distract us from the things that we were told to be aware of in the scriptures. And I felt a, a strong need to uh, talk about it and uh, remind myself and perhaps remind some of you. Uh, and the Bible spoke about mysteries. Um, do we know how to explain them to others and their children? If it's a mystery, can I explain it? Um, are they still mysteries today that the Bible spoke about? Uh, could we explain the mysteries of the scriptures or warn, if necessary, if there is a danger in not recognizing what they are? So just sort of get that uh, in your heads of where we may be going with this, but let's, I guess, look at a few what you might call fun facts. We all have fun facts that we love to talk about. Well, if you look mystery up in the, in the New Testament, it's used 24 times. 24 times the word mystery or mysteries is recorded. Um, there, now, they, these were mysteries to the Pharisees, the pagans, and unbelievers. Um, if you read the whole New Testament, all these mysteries were revealed to the believers of the first century except one. You might, might be already thinking about where that might be going, but what we will look at is that there should be no mysteries to the present day believers. And this, this is my feeling on this, and uh, maybe it's not right where you are, but it's where I am. If we come to read the scriptures regularly. But most important, what I uh, understand from it is that mystery is actually a sign for us of what lays in store for this world. And it shows us what we need to watch for. Mystery to the believers is actually a sign for us to understand not to be in the darkness. And if you're not sure what I mean by that, we'll, we'll get to it here in a little bit. Um, we can call many things mysteries that we don't understand them. I mean, like how the world was created. Uh, nowhere in the Bible does scripture try to explain how creation happened other than it did and in the order that it did. And that can be a mystery to us, uh, uh, but it is not referred to as a mystery in the scriptures. It's something that we'll understand one day. What I am referring to is those things that were tagged mystery in the scriptures. That's what we'll be looking at this morning. And can that be understood? These mysteries in the, the first century were kept hidden till the right time in history and revealed to the believers at that time, but they remained a mystery to the world in many ways and st still uh, do to some de uh, degree. So let's, what I'm going to do, we're going to look at a few things where mystery is mentioned and see if it suggest blindness or knowledge. We read in Matthew, and he, Jesus, said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Okay, You're supposed, here we're told we would know of this particular mystery and understand, we should understand it. In Romans, Apostle Paul, I believe, 
I would not, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. I don't want you to be ignorant of it, not understand it, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in a part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. These things were mysteries in the first century, but they've been resolved. The first century, there was a lot to sort out when Jesus came on the scene. Trying to sort out if he was the Messiah, is he really fulfilling prophecy? Is he the one? We know the apostles went through that whole thought process of trying to understand these things. But as we can see, um, by Paul's day, he didn't want you to be ignorant of any of it. Continue on. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was, past tense, kept secret since the world began. Uh, if any of you are uh, interested in learning more about revelations, attend the Thursday night Bible class because we're going through this. Um, the word revelation means to bring to light or apocalypse, not to remain in darkness. So the darkness should not be there just because the word says mystery. That doesn't mean there's darkness to you. This is just a handful of verses. Here's uh, one more. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So here we have to know, don't be ignorant. Uh, it's been revealed and understand in my knowledge, in the mystery. And here it's tied all to mystery. So mystery wasn't meant to be a mystery to us in this day and age. Even to the apostles before his resurrection, Jesus said things that were a mystery to them at that time, trying to understand about the gospel. He said things like, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He also said, you must be born again. We know that that was very foreign to them. The, the Pharisees struggled with it terribly, but they got it. They didn't go to their grave, never said, what was he talking about? There was, there was no mystery by time they, they all uh, came to the end of their lives. But those things were explained and the mysteries were resolved. Um, these mysteries were about the things that had been prophesied about and came to pass when Jesus came into the world. When John was the last apostle in his old age, God gave him a vision of a future mystery that would grow till Christ's return. And this mystery can, um, this can be a mystery to us if we do not know how to recognize it. And this is where I'll be going today, to recognize it. He wouldn't give it to us and then say, you'll never get it, but, I, but here it is. I'm going to write it down for you. He explains the mystery to us so that we can recognize what the world cannot see and be watchmen on the wall. Now, again, we don't hear a lot about the things I'll be looking at today as much, but it's still there. There's news on TV, and then there's the news in the scriptures. And I would strongly suggest that we tune in to the news in the scriptures more often. You go to the opening words of Revelation. Now, this will be familiar to a lot of you, and to some it'll be new, but I'm coming at it from a different place. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I think these are the most important and critical verses of Revelations to me. It sets the precedent of why he gave it to us. And keep in mind, this is the last thing that Jesus said to us, is this book, his last words. If we keep it, it means that we understand it. You can't keep something you don't understand. You don't know what to do with it. So you just set it on the shelf. Um, and you don't know what to do except to go forth, blindly believe in a mystery you can't explain. The revelation is the end of the story. And it is important to recognize where we are in it in our lifetime. 
it is an amazing uh, topic here. Excuse me, just a second. There's not enough time for me to go through how we're going to get to the conclusions I've come to historically, but it is an historical thing that has taken place in Revelations about the continuous unfolding of time. But I don't have time to go through that. You'll have to come to Thursday night class to, to get the rest of the story. So moving forward, the rev, um, this is the mystery that we were given, that John was given, even the apostles, the 11 of the apostles never heard this mystery, but John was given it to it. It says, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. So we know the revelation is about things that would come to pass from John's time forward, continuously unfolding. By the time, this is uh, Revelation 17, by the time we get to this point in time, nearly 2,000 years have passed in history to have this system morph into this beast of this woman riding on it. Because these, these heads and all are, are uh, points in time and, and, and kings and things. This is not something sometime in the far future, as many believe, but it's here right now. This is not something one day this thing this, whatever this is, or whatever it represents, is just going to show up and turn the world upside down. He goes on. Now, everything you see, I'm going to be using the words that Jesus gave. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. First of all, why is she called Babylon? If you haven't really looked into this and haven't spent time, I didn't put time into it until I was in my mid-50s. So I can understand where you might be. Why is she called Babylon? Babylon fell 2,500 years ago. They had to actually go out in the desert and dig to find it. Because she, this system has adopted into Christianity the pagan concepts that are originated in old Babylon of the Chaldean mysteries, they would call it that, and teachings that they themselves call a mystery. They use the word. So this is important that the, myst the word mystery is the sign. It's not a mystery, it's the understanding. And why is she called the mother of harlots? It is because she will produce many sects of children that spread her abomination and teachings. Jesus gave this to his servants to understand and to watch for it. Would you recognize it if it were in your midst? Would you? This, this became important for me to, to understand myself because this is, this is a warrant. What we're going to look at, the whole thing is a warning of what to watch for. It goes on. And he saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonder. As I said, the heads and the horns are nations, just in a nutshell. I can't go through it all. And kings through the centuries till today. And this woman, this harlot system has wooed those powers and she now rides upon them. And it came at the expense of the blood of the saints and many of your brothers and sisters in Christ through the last 2,000 years. If you really read about it, think about that. I never grasped the power of that thought until recently. And when it said great wonder, it's not like you're looking at something and I wonder how that happened. This wonder is great amazement, amazement of how far this apostasy will go and grow into such a symbolic creature as this. Remember that Jesus is showing John what is going to come about in the future prior to his return. And again, it's something that is not going to just appear at some point just before his return. It has been growing for centuries. And our brothers and sisters of the ages, many of them lost their lives under the system. But I'm not gonna get, go into that direction so much. Still, in Revelations 18, we move to the next chapter. And he, that's an angel, cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become, 
habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. Now Babylon fell over 2,500 years ago, but Christianity by the way of this system absorbed the pagan teachings of Babylon. He wouldn't be speaking about a nation that fell 2,500 years ago if it wasn't going to exist in some capacity in the future. That is why this is critical that you don't just read over this and do your readings every time and, and say, I, I can't get it. You can get it. Jesus knew that the influence of this system would continue with teachings like the Trinity, which was called a mystery, mother and child worship, immortality of soul, and he compares it to a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's just some serious, harsh talk. But this is what Jesus is, is saying. This is what he gave us. Um, it's very strong language. And, uh, and we can see from this very verse that it is predicting its demise. So there is an end coming to this. Would we recognize it? Or would we be caught up and wonder like the world? It goes on. Uh, well, not first these two words that we looked at, foul, it means impure. Well, of course, we kind of know that when something is foul. But also the word spirit is breath. So we have impure breath in that verse, which means impure teachings. And it's like the uh, frog spirits that are mentioned in Revelations, uh, which I won't go into, three unclean spirits like frogs that came up out of the dragon's mouth. They were unclean. And they went about doing things and changing the world and changing times. We can see why this would be a high priority to the Lord to remove when he comes. This isn't some side thing. This is the story in the, of history that he gave us, the last things he spoke. How important would the last words of Jesus' words be to you personally? If he spoke to you personally, what would you remember the most? The last words he spoke to you. Let's move on. In 1 John, really, we read, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Uh, now, some of you, this is a, would be familiar with this. Uh, some of you may remember the beast of the earth in Revelation 13, 11, that had two horns like a lamb, but spoke as a dragon. And it looks, sound, it looks and sounds like it's holy and pure, but it's a very deceiving as it has been to the world. This is one of those false prophets. The, this lamb through history has morphed into the beast of the harlot sitting on it. This was an earlier phase. This, this thing went through these phases and this was an earlier phase. Um, now, if some of you this is unfamiliar with this again, hopefully this, these things will make sense as we go along but I just felt the subject was worthy to be talked about. A continuing in 1 John, hereby know you the spirit of God. Every spirit or breath that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit or breath that confesses not that Jesus has come in this flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. And this is 96 AD. So don't think this is something, if, if you've kind of wondered, is it something in the future? This is 96 AD, and it's already there and, and growing. Mainstream Christianity is looking for the Antichrist to come in the future. But in John's day, it was already here 2,000 years ago. That is the blindness that they have. So the, the world does, doesn't recognize it that it is already amongst them and they won't recognize things when Christ appears to deal with it. It won't make any sense to them. It'll be absolute chaos and confusion to them. He goes on, for all nations, this is still Revelations 18, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The kings of the earth through the ages, have been drinking out of this same cup in her hand. You might say, yeah, I don't know about that. Well, Jesus says they are. And it's serious. Fornication here is spiritual immorality, and not 
not the sexual part, but the spiritual and in, morality. And this was through the Crusades and things that, that spread it. Now I'm going to show you some of the signs that Jesus has given us so that we would recognize the harlot and not be deceived or in any way have tolerance for any of those teachings. And he has given us signs in the last days. They weren't all signs in the past. They're signs in our day. And they, they uh, things that kind of blew me away as I, I researched this. And just to give you one here, um, by time, <clears throat> by time we get to Revelations 20 in the, the book, Jesus is upon the throne and the judgment of the world is taking place. From my understanding, now you might see a little bit different time, but if he's sitting on that, he's sitting on that throne. Uh, and here's what it says. Uh, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, that's Jesus, earth and sky fled and no place was found for them. Of course, he's talking about the heavenly orders of uh, governments and things like that. Well, this is for some of you have seen this, but to me, it just blew me away. Uh, this was about six years ago. The only man on earth given a great white throne. There is not another man in the world that gets treated this way. It, just the sign of it is emotional to me because um, we can understand. He doesn't rule over a country. He has no army that he leads. The president of the United States or Putin of Russia, the most powerful men on earth would not get to sit on a stage for a, a audition by this woman. I think that's Aretha Franklin, I guess. Um, in a 10, ten foot tall throne. They would be in a special presidential box or seated for dignitaries. This is the influence that this mother of harlots has risen in the last days. You'll never see anybody else or the world do anything else like this. Look what it says in Thessalonians. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day um, shall come except there be come had fallen away first, and that man of sin revealed, the son of perdition, um, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the warning. Let no man deceive you. So we need to stay alert to these things when things like that arise. It should jump off at us when we see things like that. The word perdition means spiritual ruin. In other words, he's coming to spiritual ruin, not him, the whole system. Um, our Lord would not leave us blind concerning this. And, he, and with their own words, they reveal this mystery to us. This is uh, Pope Pius XI back in 1922. These are his own words. You know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on earth, the victor of Christ, which means I am God on earth. That, that should just be so uh, uh, interesting that these words were preserved for us to tie to that scripture. This is a sign that we are looking in the right place there should be no mystery. Do you, it goes on in Thessalonians, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now re restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. It has been revealed. It has been revealed. It has been, re uh, from our last slide, we have proof that it has been revealed. There sh there's no mystery there. It just, here's an, we see world leaders kiss his hand. If you don't recognize, this is Barbara Bush and President Bush right behind him. Do you think he kisses their, their hands? Do you ever see the president kiss Putin's hand or other people's? but everybody kisses his hand. 
The seed of the beast has changed position in the world quite a bit from earlier times. When the Holy Roman Empire fell, she found another way to gain her loss of influence. She was pretty much a superpower through the Dark Ages in her own right. It no longer has, again, military might behind it, like in the Crusades, so it is morphing with the circumstances and political movements of the times, and we've seen this. This is happening right before our eyes, and it, it can get diffused into all the things that are going on that affects us daily, like COVID and, and uh, the capital riots, which are very interesting to monitor. But this is what Jesus said to keep your eyes open for. Look what she, now she talks. I sit a queen, this is Revelation 18, same chapter. I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. That's arrogance. This is what the harlot system says. This means I will not fall or lose power. If you believe you are God on earth, how can you fall? You're God on earth, you're the vicar of Christ. So this is the language that's in the mind of this. I tend with uh, Revelations 18, three, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And brother Robert, Robert said, that if you read uh, 13 lectures of the apocalypse, which is what got me started on this study, he said they were dealers in Rome's merchandise of indulgences, preferments, and ecclesiastical privileges. This is about through history what she has had power over. And it's been a lot if you read the history of it, the control, and even decide whether you had food or shelter or not. The next very next verse and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues this is not a suggestion this is a command do not tie yourself to this in any way you may say well I'm, I'm not a Catholic so I, I'm okay uh, not if you tolerate the teachings and and allow it to dwell amongst you in your uh, religious life. I am reminded that when Moses told the children of Israel to stand back from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram just before the earth opened up and swallowed them, he's, he's telling you here, I'm about to do something like this again, but on a larger scale. We are being warned because the threat is very real. This is a plea from the newly established government of Jerusalem to separate yourself from her. The new Jerusalem that is going to come down from heaven and any involvement with her will bring the same destruction upon you. This is all very important, and it might even be hard to hear, but this is important, very important, and, I'm, and, and this, this is Christ. And it's kind of like last call. Now, let's see some striking parallels. This is actually a picture of old Babylon that they dug out of the desert. It disappeared off the map until they just found it within the last 100, 150 years. I don't know what, but this was the most powerful place in the world at one time. Well, let's go back and look in um, Jeremiah's day, what he said about Babylon then. Now I will punish Bel, or Babylon, and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed up, and the nation shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. There's proof of it. Um, my people, go ye out from the midst her, and deliver you every man his soul from the fear saying of the Lord. Here we have Babylon falling and to come out of her. So something about this world still carries on that he needs to make that, that command again, that it still exists. The buildings may have disappeared into the sand, but a lot of things did not disappear into the sand. The shadows are absolutely striking. Revelations 18, still, for her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. There is no more time. This, this is the moment of her final destruction that's being recorded here. So it's imperative that we separate from anything having to do with her. We shouldn't have no tolerance for anything that is part of this system especially the teachings. We cannot afford to lower the bar of truth as we know it, lest we become diluted in some way. 
I'm not saying not try to teach those who are, are of this persuasion. I, I've had many friends who are of that persuasion and tried to talk to. We should always let the light of the truth shine to all who will listen and help them escape the future that awaits this uh, beast that we've been looking at. The next verse, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works and the cup which she has filled to her double. What that's saying is the saints of the ages who suffered at her hand will take part in that judgment because he's saying you reward her as she rewarded you. True justice will be carried out by the resurrected saints of the ages. All those brothers and sisters who fell during the dark ages and all. The church thinks it will always exist. Here's what she says. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, de deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. That's again, that's such arrogance. I am sure that there are many in the world who would think it could never fall. The system could never collapse. It's like they thought Rome couldn't fall. And they probably thought old Babylon couldn't fall. It's too large of an organization. This is the world's mindset and will never, because I will never know sorrow. But look what the Lord says. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. That's, that's the Lord talking. It's not me. It's not my opinion. It's the Lord. Um, we can see that the destruction will be very quick. Like the old Babylon, if you know the history, it, it fell in the night. It was very quickly. But I want to look at this phrase, I am no widow, because it's another sign to understand. Let's go back and look at old Babylon one more time. In Isaiah's time, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Sit thou silent and get thee into the darkness, O daughter of the Chaldean. For you shall no more be called the lady of kingdoms. Now, if you look, it's interesting. This kind of blew me away. That word lady, if you look it up in Strong's, it's mistress. The mistress of kingdoms. And we know what a mistress is. It's something that woos multiple lovers. Um, here again, we can see the parallel in old Babylon. The reason is that the that Babylon of this future vision has adopted the teachings, the ways, in many ways they've adopted that. Continuing on with Isaiah, he's, and I say, and you said, I shall be a lady, mistress, forever, so that you did not lay these things to your heart, neither did remember the latter end of it. Therefore, hear now this, that you are given to pleasures that dwell carelessly, that says in your heart, I am and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. We can see the shadows so clearly, so clearly in Isaiah. Loss of children is, is saying here, as she's acknowledging herself to be a mother. Uh, and of course, she was called the mother of harlots. This is fascinating, absolutely, it should be, uh, at least it is to me. It tells us that we are looking in the right place. But continuing on, still in Isaiah, there's so much there. But these two things shall come on you in a moment. In one day, the loss of children and widowhood, they shall come upon you in their perfection for the multitude of your sorceries and for the great abundance of enchantments. The influence of Babylon, as we know, would continue until Christ returns. If we know our history, we know it would. Uh, we know that old Babylon fell very quickly, but we know that it continues. And we know that because of Nebuchadnezzar's image. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream of, of coming world kingdoms in Daniel 2, the head of gold was Babylon. And of course, the other nations represented afterwards. Where this mindset started, will continue until the ten-toed period and be destroyed all at once. Where it took thousands of years for this image to stand up 
and be what it is. It will be destroyed very quickly. And as the scriptures say, with this stone, which is Christ, will be ground to powder. Now, we move into keeping on this. Now, it, it's amazing how this story is unfold. You could read through this and miss a lot of this. And this. The next verse. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. This is how the world will react. They will be totally blindsided by the return of Christ and that one of the first... Is, uh, and that it is one of the first targets of this system um, of Christ, and they mourn for her because they don't understand. Um, so they're they're crying for her as she's taken out. Um, we need to know why we don't need to be part of that. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, "Alas, alas, that great city Babylon." That mighty city, for in one hour is your judgment come. See the parallel of the old ba uh, Babylon. This is the reaction as it unfolds. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one more verse here. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. Okay, so what? what is the merchandise? What, they're not buying the merchandise from the world anymore. Well, believe it or not, we're given a list. We're given quite a list. Uh, the merchants of gold and of silver and of precious stones, of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory, all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. Now think of everything that was controlled through the ages by the Holy Roman Empire if you understand in its heyday. But the list goes on. And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. That's the kicker right there, souls of men. How many times through history did people have to pay to be forgiven or to buy, pay to buy their loved ones out of so-called purgatory? as it is. This was their merchandise. Let's go on. It's not over yet as it unfolds. It says, and the merchants of these things were made rich by her, by her and shall stand afar off in the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and in scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. We're even told how they would dress. If that is not significant. Is there any question to the seriousness of recognizing this? Some may not know uh, that many years ago, uh, several hundred years ago, on the Pope's mitre, it used to have mystery written right across his forehead. And it, they removed it because they were getting identified with this, this, this revelation. Where did the, the harlot have it written? Across her forehead. So again, that was a, time, a sign for back then, uh, back in Dr. Thomas's and farther back. And, say, and they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, a great city wherein we're made rich. All that had ships, the sea, by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. They just can't believe that it is gone, especially if you believe again that it was God on earth. We can see why we must consider these things very serious in our time. And brother uh, Robert Roberts again in his book, he, he said this about that verse. He said, nothing would arouse the world's attention more than the disappearance of through earthquake, tempest and fire of the city of the Pope. With its Vatican palace, nothing short of such a catastrophe would answer to the features of this chapter. And that, that's so true. But then we have a little contrast in the very next verse. Where do we fit in all this? He says, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you upon her. This is in contrast to while that's happening, the, mourning, the contrast to the mourning merchants of Babylon. 
this is our part. Here's where we want to be. Now, let's break this down a little. Rejoice over her uh, heaven. Uh, if you look at it, it's referring to the new government under Christ, not just the heavens where God dwells. But if you look it up, that's what it is. And rejoice in apostles and prophets implies that the resurrection has taken place. If they're taking part in it, the resurrection has already taken place, which means we are going to be there also. We will be caught away if we're still alive. He says, God hath avenged you. What does that mean? This is an answer to the prayers of the saints of the ages that remained in the memory of God. And your prayers can be the same if you struggle. We have to go back to the fifth seal. For those, I know not everyone's familiar with this, but uh, earlier on in the fifth seal, there were souls under a, a, a figurative altar who were crying out for justice. And here's what it says. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that is slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes was given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and the brethren that should be killed as they should, as they were, should be fulfilled. So at the time of Revelation 6, there were still more that were going to perish before this prayer was answered. But that day has arrived. By the time you get to this, where we are, uh, looking right here, where to, to rejoice over it. We, we saw all this happen to, uh, through the crusades and inquisitions of how people suffered. But I, I see this, the prayers, uh, the souls under the altar. It's like when C Cain slew Abel. God told him, his blood cries to me from the ground. I know he was mine. And I will remember, and there will be justice. And justice at this point has come to the saints of the Most High. Then continuing on, I'm not jumping all over scripture. I'm just going right down the verses. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence, we can expect that. It's going to be violence. Shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Again, we can see there's not going to be, well, we'll, we'll try to negotiate, work it out, you, you know, and, and think, no, that's not going to happen. This is what's coming and is yet to be seen. But look how he goes on here. He says, and the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in you. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft shall be found any more in you. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in you. You hear a finality in this? And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in you. And he goes one step further. He says, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in you. Think of it in contrast to the bride of Christ. No more. You think the symbol is a millstone at the bottom of the sea. This is what the finality, the mind, he, the picture he wants you to have in your mind. He goes, for the merchants that were great men of the earth, but by your sorcerers, sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. This is so important that we understand this. God and Jesus, this is how God and Christ view these things. We live in a time of great tolerance. It's the, the big word. It's probably the most said word now in our, our language. But as we can see, when Jesus comes, he will have no tolerance. And we must be of the same spirit. This is critical. Second Peter, we read, but there will be false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, souls of men, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. It means it's, 
it's coming. So he says, no more. We can see how much Christ pushed this point. And I didn't catch it for many years. But again, in contrast, but let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife have made herself ready. Think about no more with the, the bride and the groom and the marriage take place. And, um, this is not one single moment we all, is this not, excuse me, is this not one single moment we all long for? From our baptism forward, we have lived our lives for this very day. Just being here today, we're trying to make ourselves ready. I'm trying to help you. You help me. We're working in it together. And this is the table we look forward to sitting at. He says, and he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are true sayings of God. Have you ever thought about, now I know this is a symbolic thing, but I have no doubt we'll sit with the brethren of the ages forever. Uh, but when we sit down at this table, whether figuratively or literally, we will be equal unto the angels. This is what he's offering us if we keep ourselves clean and unspotted from the world. With whatever that involves, to be like the angels, I'm sure we even begin to understand what it means to be made like the angels. Um, and we will be sharing those new experiences and emotions with each other. Imagine experiencing that just with you guys in the room. Imagine sharing them with uh, some guy, brother or sister, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Sit across the table with someone from hundreds and thousands of years ago and start new relationships from the condition of immortality. What a highlight that will be on that day. I think about that a lot. So I will labor the point no more. Brethren, there should be no mystery in our knowledge of these things. There is no mystery. I, I hope I've showed that if you had any doubt. And these here, are, and I'm going to close with these. These are some of the last words that Jesus said to us. This is what he thought was important to end with. This is his sign-off verbally to us. He said, and this is the last chapter, so it's the last paragraph of his speaking. And he said unto me, these sayings are faithful sayings and faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy God, and the Lord God of the holy, God of holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly uh, uh, be, come, be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I believe I have it written twice there. I apologize for that. But, uh, the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Um, I apologize for that typo. But this is what he closed with. Keep these things. I've showed you. I'm giving you breadcrumbs along the centuries and, and follow them. He said, um, Brethren, we must keep these things as commanded and to hold fast to the precious gem he has given us in our knowledge of these things um, that are truly a mystery to the world. But I hope in some way I've helped them not be a mystery to you. Thank you.